So will this bring the cross back or is it too late? Is the damage done? Well, good morning, Peter. I think this is about a bright and sophisticated future for King's Cross and one that really has safety embedded in it. There's no doubt that the cross has changed over the last five years, but King's Cross is such an important part of the cultural offering here in Sydney. We think we've created a safer environment. We rolled back the lockout laws across the rest of Sydney CBD 12 months ago. We said we would take 12 months to monitor King's Cross and we've now decided that it's time to bring King's Cross in line with the rest of the Sydney CBD. There'll still be some activity in place around ID scanners, which will allow police to continue to do their job in that community. And we'll monitor what takes place there. But we're confident that King's Cross has a really bright future and one that's embedded in safety. So why, if it's all about safety, why, why remove the marshals then, the RSA marshals? So these, uh, the RSA marshals and the drinks uh, regulations that you were talking about were part of the broader lockout laws. So right. there are still RSA marshals that exist across licensed premises in New South Wales. They'll continue as normal. So this is really just about bringing King's Cross in line with the rest of Sydney CBD. Currently, right now, there's a number of COVID-related restrictions like QR code check-ins that will still stay in place. So this is really just about making sure that King's Cross isn't treated differently, uh, that it's treated exactly the same as the rest of the CBD. Last year, we introduced some laws through the Parliament that allow our liquor and licensing regulator to measure cumulative impact. And so as new licences emerge in King's Cross, we'll be able to manage those. But what really what we've seen over the last few years is a number of those larger drinking establishments leave the cross and be replaced by smaller bars and more restaurants. So the licence conditions have changed dramatically and so right. has the offering. And we think King's Cross has got a really bright future. So was that worth it in the end? those policy changes? Uh, absolutely. I think Sydney five years ago really needed a change. The lockout laws were designed to do that. We've seen a strong behavioural change across Sydney. We've also seen a lot of change of culture around drinking in this city. Uh, we've seen a lot of changes to the way people offer uh, alcohol. So smaller bars, um, more sophisticated offerings, a stronger focus on quality rather than volume. Uh, and King's Cross has moved in that direction as well. We've seen a lot more restaurants uh, pop up across the city and the same thing has happened in King's Cross. So this is about making sure that Sydney really stands out as a 20 for our economy, but does so in a safe and secure way. Well, anti-violence campaigners aren't going to be too pleased with this. Um, what can you say that, that would alleviate some of their concerns? And were they even involved in the process? Yeah, we've been engaged with people right across the city over the last 12 months. I know that not every single person and every organisation across New South Wales is going to support this decision. That was the same uh, last year when we rolled back the lockout laws across the Sydney CBD. Uh, but we've seen a number of changes to our licensing conditions. Uh, there's strong working relationship with New South Wales Police as well as New South Wales Health. Uh, King's Cross itself has had uh, lower than average crime across our boxer crime-related figures. Uh, we've seen lower patronage numbers through King's Cross. So we think the time is right to be able to roll back these restrictions that have existed for over five years now and really give King's Cross a chance to flourish in a fantastic way that encourages people to come into the cross but also does it in a safe and secure way. OK. Uh, Minister, uh, John Barillaro said yesterday pork barrelling is what elections are for. Do you agree with him? Uh, I think it's important that governments go to the, the people, whether it's here in New South Wales or right across the country, with a plan that often includes commitments that are financially backed by government funding. We've got to make those commitments up front. Uh, I'm not saying that we're out pork barrelling uh, in every single electorate, but I think the point the Deputy Premier was making about governments making commitments and delivering on those commitments is a fair one. So you believe in it? Uh, I think we all make commitments. I think we, we invest money where we think will deliver a good outcome for the community. I know when it comes to uh, particularly these bushfire funds, they've been going to the communities where the most impact, particularly around loss of homes, have been. I think the Deputy Premier raised some mm. very valid points about where that loss of, of houses and property had taken place. Um, we've also got around $70 million more to be able to roll out uh, in those bushfire relief funds, and I'm sure that they'll yeah. be going uh, into other locations across the state I as well. I guess the question remains, and, and critics will argue, that those commitments point to seats that you hold. 
Well, I th we've also, um, when it comes to the bushfire-related funds, they've gone to locations right across the state. Um, like I said before, there's more funding to roll out. Um, there was criteria that were set out. I know some councils at the time hadn't met that. A lot of the effort that we were putting in was to get funds into communities quickly. So if projects had longer lead times, they were always probably going to make their way into the second round of this funding. I think the Deputy Premier made that pretty clear yesterday. OK, Stuart Ayres, appreciate your time this morning. Thanks for coming on. Talk to you soon. Not a problem. Thanks, Peter.